not for nothing at all. But if you're under five, you're 17 or under, a quarter pays your ride. For everyone else, it's a dollar, but it's still one good time. So we save the cable car for everyone to ride. After a two-year layoff for repairs, San Francisco's delightful cable cars are once again full of tourists and natives and straining to climb the steep hills of this city by the bay. With all the tourists and delegates in town for the convention, the cable cars are still getting all the attention. The cars are getting more attention than the assembled horde of politicians and media stars. After all, the convention is a temporary phenomenon. It'll move on soon. The cable cars are one of the enduring symbols of San Francisco. I came all the way from Chicago to be on the cable cars. And I wouldn't come if it wasn't for the cable cars. <laughs> Walter Scott is our driver, or Gripman for this tour. He's a cable car veteran, and nobody, nobody is happier to see the cars back than Walter. Ah, uh, there's a duck waddle. Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm happy to be back. It's nice. Walter's job is a strenuous one. Not just because there's a lot of exercise involved. Walter's job requires him to be a tour guide. All right, next stop the uh, pine. Anybody want pine steak? And a comedian. Behind me, we got an island of traps. And Walter has learned to be very patient. A cable car, for all its charm, still can't maneuver around a car that's double parked. I can't go anywhere at the moment. Hey! <laughs> Convention goers have jammed San Francisco this week, and each one of them, it seems, wants to ride a cable car. That doesn't phase our Walter. San Francisco, San Francisco is crazy anyway. A ride in a cable car is hardly your run-of-the-mill tourist activity. It is, to put it simply, an experience. And it's easy to see why tourists and residents of San Francisco are more than just a little happy to have the cable cars back on track. In San Francisco, John Kirby, News Watch 12. Surrounded by fog and mystery, you may be looking at the most fascinating prison in the world. More movies have been made about it, more books written about it, and more myths surround it than any other jail you can name. Alcatraz, nicknamed The Rock, is a 12-acre island fortress in the middle of San Francisco Bay, and it attracts three-quarters of a million tourists every year. They come to visit a prison. Imagine, just for a second, getting off this boat as a guest of the government. Now, we're taking the two-hour tour. In those days, when the federal penitentiary was here, the tours were just a little bit longer. If you came to Alcatraz as a prisoner some years ago, you'd walk up a steep hill to your new home. You take the same walk as a tourist. Ranger Dennis is our tour guide. The tour is all about Alcatraz, um, the federal penitentiary, the 29-year history of the federal prison. He is a fount of knowledge who'll fill us in on Alcatraz folklore. Al Capone was here, Machine Gun Kelly, Robert Stroud, the Birdman of Alcatraz. On the drudgery of life here. You were allowed to get out of your cell three times a day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which was 20 minutes apiece, a uh, shower twice a week, and a haircut once a month. Why he'll even debunk a myth or two. Now, officially, nobody has escaped from the island, although there are five men who are missing, and they are presumed drowned. By the way, the Birdman of Alcatraz never kept a bird at Alcatraz. All the birds he owned he had at Leavenworth but who'd see a movie called The Birdman of Leavenworth? Such is the appeal of The Rock. If you lived here pre-1963, this was your room. If you really couldn't behave, you spent a few days here. Once you learned to behave yourself, you were awarded some exercise time in the yard. Since July on Alcatraz is a little like January in New England, the privilege was a dubious one. Alcatraz was closed in 1963 for the oldest reason in the world. It was too expensive to operate. Now in this city of seemingly endless tourist fun, this island rock is a strangely appealing tourist attraction. Escaping from Alcatraz, John Kirby, Newswatch 12, San Francisco. Today we visit with James Avery in Kerrville. James Avery, jewelry with a distinction. Now what a nice guy. He showed us around his plant. Leo Bashan over here, and he uh, he's been in the jewelry he's been in the jewelry business uh, longer than all of us put together. 
<laughs> he's one so of the he's, originals. He's huh? the master in, the, in this whole crew. Over here, what is he doing? He is. No, he, he's he's waxing a ring. ring? He's made. He's sizing a ring that's uh, that's been uh, that's been uh, molded in wax. These people that are here are artists in their own right. Well, I got my beginning uh, uh, way back up north, and I came down here in the Air Force uh, back in 1943, and uh, that's how I got to Texas originally. And I'm an industrial designer. I came back into the church and. Uh, and started making some pieces of jewelry uh, that are religious uh, uh, orientation and uh, <clears throat> were very important to me personally. He is now working on Ethiopian jewelry on behalf of that country's plight. We're very uh, conscious of the problems in Ethiopia and of course the art uh, from that area of the world is beautiful. Maybe we'll market that and maybe uh, give some sort of a, a return from the sales of uh, any of that jewelry to the uh, distressed people in Ethiopia. 70 miles north of San Antonio in Kerrville. That's where it comes from, James Avery Jewelry. Bill Cutterback in Kerrville for KSAT 12 News. Welcome to Arashiyama West, home of over 350 Japanese snow monkeys. Arashiyama is Japanese for Storm Mountain, their ancient mountain home. But another troop forced these snow monkeys off Arashiyama into the suburbs of Kyoto. They became pests and problems for people there and were brought to Texas by a rancher who thought it would be more interesting to raise monkeys than cattle. Just 12 years ago, these guys lived in forests of evergreens and snowy mountains. Now they're living in the flatlands and desert of Texas and doing even better than their cousins in Japan. And they've really learned to survive in Texas. They've learned to eat cactus and mesquite beans. They have a special call just for rattlesnakes. They distinguish between rattlesnakes and chicken snakes. When these calls are introduced to Japanese monkeys, they just don't know what they're talking about. There aren't any snakes in Japan, and they're very, the, the Japanese researchers laugh and say the biggest predators in Japan are motorcycles and tourists. All of which is Greek, or in this case, Japanese, to these Texan snow monkeys. Lou Griffin manages Arashiyama West. She's seen every type of phenomenon that occurs in a human society happen here, with one exception. There's no child abuse. Griffin says they act a lot like humans in many ways. It's almost exactly like teenage humans, because the little boys are a lot greater risk of having something happen to them. These 13 family groups have been studied for 30 years in Japan and the United States. Scientists from Canada, France, Japan, and the U.S. marvel at the adaptability of these animals. They're adapting so well and producing so much, the money to support them is running out. People at Arashiyama West say Texas can't afford to lose the snow monkey. It's not only a natural resource, but it's playing a key role in the research of several diseases. Steve Andrews, KSAT 12 News.